Hello, good evening, and once again, welcome at the Uplifting Crew Talk. Now, the five minutes have passed, so I would kindly ask everyone to slowly take their seat, take their drink, settle for a bit right now. And even though I know the food is great, I can tell you the talks are going to be even better. And I have to admit, I haven't seen the dry runs, but uh, at least from what my colleagues told me, uh, they are supposed to be one of the best talks we have ever had at an uplifting crew talk. So there is definitely something you can look forward to, except for the food. Now, I see that everyone is uh, mostly settled, so uh, let's begin with the introductions. Now, you're not going to hear anything uh, smart from me today. My name is Vojta and I am just the moderator. However, I will introduce you to some of our speakers from Uplifting, Digi2 and Iguana, who definitely have some interesting uh, information to tell you today. So, about the practical stuff. Today, we are going to have three talks. The first one will be by Lukasz Knapek. He is uh, our home developer, he's a tech lead at Uplifting, and he's also an amazing senior developer himself. Uh, then we will have uh, a talk called What the Hype is About in Next.js 13 that will be held by Jakub Havelka who came all the way from Iguana. And last but not least, we have the tech lead from Digi2, Vojta Eschner, who will talk about the Clash of the Titans Gatsby versus Next. Uh, after each of the talks, uh, there will be enough space for your questions and discussion with the speakers. And you will have the two options to ask your questions. You can ask directly with a microphone here in, uh, in the meetup space, or if you are shy or watching online, we will also have a Slido, which I believe you have here, so let me just move, and you can scan that right away and ask online too. And then the last uh, piece of information that I would like to give you right now is that you should listen very, very carefully to what the, what the speakers have to say, because we have an interesting quiz at Uplifting, uh, that's about front-end, uh, about the content of the talks. And I believe there should be a QR code somewhere on the wall. One is right there, and then one is at the, this pillar from the other side. And if you scan that, you can win some uh, nice and brand new gifts from us. And I believe that's all the practical information that I have to say. So now would be time to start with the good stuff that you actually came for. As I said, the first talk is from Lukáš Knápek and will be about micro frontends. Now, Lukáš, uh, you are a tech lead at Uplifting, you are a senior software developer, you are just an amazing guy to talk to, but you are also a father, a father, but not a father of a kid, of a human being. You are a father of a seaweed, seaweed ball called Frank that you grew in water tank here at Uplifting. And I don't know if it's important for you to know this, but I think it's fascinating. So with that, I would like to uh, invite Lukáš to the stage and take his talk. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see me, most importantly? Uh, yeah, OK. Seems all right. Uh, sorry? Yeah, uh, could you up to one a bit? Okay, is that any better? Can you hear me in the back? Uh, maybe even a little bit higher? Is that better? That sounds like it has to be better. Okay, uh, let's get started then. Uh, where's the presenter thing? Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk on micro front ends or micro front ends, just depends on just about where you are from. Uh, what are they and why you should care? So, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. So, my name is Lukáš. I'm a front-end tech lead here at Uplifting. Uh, I used to be a full-stack developer, but now I'm mostly specialized in front-end. And if you are curious to know, my first programming experience was creating Excel macros in Visual Basic. My, my high school was like very uh, weird about that. And if you want to know, the, the second language I, I was thought was C-sharp, so it was quite a, quite a leap. Uh, 
I, I've tried about just, uh, I've tried a lot of languages and I stuck with JavaScript or rather TypeScript nowadays. And I'm pretty happy in that place for now. So that's enough about me, uh, let's move on. So the question of the day is what are micro front ends? And uh, logically the next, next questions are why are micro front ends relevant? How are micro front ends implemented? And when are micro front ends uh, good and bad? So let's start with the most important question. What are micro front ends? Here is kind of sort of the official definition you can find on martinfowler.com. Micro front ends, an architectural style where independently deliverable front end applications are composed into a greater whole. Right, excellent, no, no notes, it's just perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I can totally understand what they meant by that. In case you didn't for some reason, here's kind of my uh, simple definition. So in order to create a micro front end, take your average web application, break it down into smaller independent apps, develop and release each app separately, and then connect the apps uh, together at runtime when they are deployed. So you can see I've uh, emphasized the runtime part. That's very important and we'll come back to that. So here's Spotify. Uh, why did I include Spotify in my uh, presentation? It's because at one point uh, Spotify was known for having used uh, micro front ends. I don't believe they do that nowadays, uh, at, at least uh, a random, random Twitter post I could find. But it's a great app where I can showcase how to work with micro front ends and what's their utility. So imagine you have uh, an app of the size and complexity of Spotify, right? Now, how would you split this app into multiple smaller apps? If it was up to me, I would do something like this. So we have sort of like the, the main section in the middle, kind of like the discovery, we got the player on the bottom, the list of playlists and whatnot, uh, the list of friends and the stuff that I never use. And on the very top, we have kind of the layout, kind of the header that, uh, that is there every time and in every place. So imagine you split your app into these, uh, these like one, two, three, four, five, five apps, and then connect them at runtime. That's basically what micro, uh, micro front ends are. I'm sorry, I'm gonna switch between those two pronunciations. There's no logic to it. <laughs> so what does it mean to have multiple apps? When I say app, I truly mean an independent uh, app, mostly probably React. I, I assume most of us here are React developers. Uh, so it means that each app has its own developer team, it has its own CI CD pipelines, and it has its own deployment and release process. And sometimes it even has its own very uh, specific backend. This pattern is called backend for front end, by the way. Okay, here's the chart. On this chart, you can kind of see the evolution, I would say, of web applications. So it used to be that every uh, web application used to be this big monolith where the front end and the back end would kind of seamlessly merge into one uh, huge code base. Then over time, we've learned what microservices are and then everyone did microservices. And then someone thought, why not do microservices but on front end? And that's where we get to this point where we have these vertical domains or sometimes just called verticals and uh, basically the micro front ends are on the top, that's, that's like the top layer. You might be wondering why you see React, Angular and Vue respectively in those individual apps and that's because that's one of the advantages of micro front ends, you can just like mix and match your technologies. Uh, th there's another question if that's a good idea to which I say no but we'll get to that later. Here's another chart which kind of depicts the same thing and it emphasizes that each app is its own separate application with its own source control, uh, built and test pipeline, and its own release process that gets it to production. And then uh, in production or when it's released, the apps get composed into one whole giant app. Well, that's all cool and good, but have you ever tried connecting multiple React apps before, for example? How would you go about doing that? Uh, when you really think about it, each React app, if, if it's client, client side app, if, uh, we are not talking about uh, server side apps or static generated apps. 
uh, it's really just a bundle of JavaScript, isn't it? It's just one huge or multiple huge JavaScript files. So there are several ways to connect them to each other. Uh, one of the ways is using iframes, which uh, I don't know how about you, but I never really liked working with iframes. Like they're kind of yucky. Uh, then we have these strict tags where we just like explicitly state, uh, explicitly inject a, the JavaScript bundle into our own code somewhere. Which okay, it's it's better, but it's not great either. And then we have web components. How many of you have ever heard of web components, by the way? Okay, that's more than I expected, honestly. <laughs> uh, but, but basically, the idea is the same as script tags, but you're doing things uh, the official web uh, uh, w W3C uh, way, which, okay, still not right. So uh, you can see that I'm not particularly enthusiastic about any of these uh, ways. So what if there was a secret fourth way? And there is, and it's called module federation. Uh, now, module federation sounds a little complicated. Uh, but the basic idea is that you can, for example, in your React app, you can import modules uh, that are not available to you at runtime, uh, at build time, but they are available at runtime. So you basically say, hey, Webpack, or hey, Beat, I want to import this component or this module, and it's not in my code base, but it's, there's going to be one in the code uh, like at some point. Like, trust me, bro. And module federation is supported by Webpack 5 and Beat. I'm going to showcase it on Beat later in the live demo. Okay, so now we have maybe a bit abstract idea of what micro frontends are. Now the question is why you should care, like what makes them useful? So to showcase this, I'm really going to talk about large apps and what are the pain points of large apps. And if you have ever worked on a large or enterprise app, you probably know about those or you have felt those before. So there's coupling. Uh, coupling basically means that when you change one module, uh, the changes affect other modules as well. In programming in general, we want to have as, as low of a coupling as possible, but you might know that it's kind of a losing battle and when you are working on an app that's been developed for like three, four, five years, like kind of everything's connected together. Like you can kind of fight uh, fight against that using clean code practices and good architecture, but it's it's hard. It's tough. Complexity. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward. The larger your app is, the more complex it is. Like, yeah, you, you need to know more ab about the workings of the app, about what's going on inside, in order to do something in it. Scalability. This is a huge one. Uh, especially if your app is kind of lopsided in its usage, which means that some page, pages or some features of the app get used by users much more often th than others. But you still can't like scale it independently. You still have to like replicate the app, spin it in more containers in its entirety. And finally, we've got team organization, which is just like in general, uh, the more developers in your project, the harder it is to coordinate them, uh, the harder it is to establish some sort of meaningful communication between them. Cool, so how do micro frontends solve this? So, when you split your big app into small apps, the small apps are simpler. That's pretty straightforward, right? Now, each app can have its own autonomous team, so you can have small teams as well. Each app gets released independently, so uh, kind of it's easier to release different parts of your large app at different times. There is usually no lockstep release process where you release one dependency and then everyone else depends on that dependency, so every other part of your app has to re-release as well. Uh, Micro frontends encourage decoupling by minimal interaction because the apps are mostly independent. They do communicate with each other, but it's discouraged and it should be kept to a minimum. Uh, and this is a huge one. Uh, apps can be scaled individually as necessary. So for example, in Spotify, uh, if you had the discovery micro frontend, it's probably going to be used the most. Uh, let's, let's say that's the case. So you can scale it much more efficiently. You can uh, spin up much more instances of that particular app. 
And finally, uh, as I mentioned before, you can use different frameworks or libraries in your uh, apps if you want to. I, I would not suggest that, but it's an option. Okay, uh, now it's live demo time, so that's going to work perfectly. Uh, so I'm going to show you a simple local microphone and app where most of the non-configuration code was written by ChatGPT, which, which means it's pretty bad, but it was really quick to do, so I did that. So this code does not represent the standards of uplifting. I, I have to put this disclaimer in here. Uh, and one more thing to mention, this is not an official way to do microphone dance. There is no one official way. There are a variety of options in terms of how to connect uh, the microphone dance, how to split your app into microphone dance even. So let's start with part one, which is the project structure. In my demo, I'm going to show you uh, all my apps hosted in a monorepo. I'm going to use Yarn Workspaces, although you could use any other tool for management of monorepos. Uh, and each app is a full React app. And the goal of this phase is to set up the structure and extract as much config as possible. So let me just old step here. Okay, can you see that? Is that uh, big enough? Okay, great. Uh, yeah, that's my repository over here. There's not a whole lot, uh, not a whole lot of bunch of stuff in here, but we've got the apps folder. And this is where our microphone ends live. So we have four microphone ends and one common folder, which hosts like the common or shared logic between, between them. So if I take a look at some random uh, microphone ends, say catalog, uh, this, this folder structure seems familiar, right? You've got your uh, Vite config or Webpack config, depending on what bundler, what bundler you prefer. You got TS config, you got your own dependency management. Yeah, but it definitely looks like its own separate app. So that's great. And yeah, and you will notice that even when I look at the TS config or Vite config, they are mostly taken from the root configurations. So that's like some common configuration, uh, sorry, some configuration that's common to all the micro frontends. So if I show you that on TS config dot app dot JSON, it's just like basic TS config, but this gets kind of inherited or extended by each individual micro frontend app. Cool. So that's what it looks like at the first glance. Uh, the next phase is to develop the individual apps or be able to run the apps uh, individually. So uh, there's an important point, and I'm actually going to show you. I just realized I haven't shown you the, the actual app yet. Uh, just a second. There we go. So this is the app. This is our entire uh, app. It's a very ugly site which has like some sort of a hero section, uh, introduction blurb. Uh, it has these uh, latest products, latest blog posts and you are able to go to the full list of products, which is like some sort of random catalog, and you can go to the full list of posts. That's it, no, no, nothing terribly fancy about that. Uh, it doesn't even seem like it's made of multiple apps, maybe at the first glance, uh, but it is. And I can probably show you if I go to here. I just realized it's hard to type with a microphone in my hand. Uh, Let's try surf all V. And then the next one, yarn dev shell. By the way, shell or container is the name for kind of the root micro front end, which manages the other micro front ends. It, it tells them where to render, uh, passes some data to them, and usually handles most of the cross cutting concerns. Okay, cool. If I go back, yeah, there we go. Uh, you can now see the boundaries around each individual mi micro front end. So this blue thing is a app, and inside this blue thing is actually more apps, this green app and this yellow app. And if I go to the list of all products, it's all green, it's like an entire app. So you get the idea of how this works. 
And this, this little bit uh, on the top, this kind of a header or nav bar, is the shell microphone then, which kind of puts this whole thing together. Okay, now, uh, I've said that each app has to be able to be run individually. So let me do that. Localhost, let's say 3001. Yep, and that's our home app. So it's the same thing as here, but there's no container on the top. It's just the home. Or if I wanted to, I could go to the other app. Yep, that's the full catalog. Uh, and so I can develop and release these apps in isolation, and they only get connected into the entire app at runtime. Okay, so that's great. Now, how do we integrate the app? Uh, we do that using the module federation. So let's take a look at how it actually works. Let's go to shell, beat config, and there we go. We are using the federation plugin, and it's basically really simple. It just uh, lists the name of the remotes, which, is, which are the other micro front ends and where they can be found, which is like localhost under different, different ports. Uh, for instance, if I take a look at, uh, at home meet config, this one is interesting because it is a micro front end which exposes itself, but also uses other micro front ends. So it exposes its home component, and then it uses the catalog and posts uh, micro front ends. So you can kind of nest micro front ends uh, like that if you want to. And that's, that's basically all the glue there is. That, that's all the logic that you need to connect the apps. Uh, maybe let's just go to home. Let's see how it actually works. So I'm importing, uh, for example, the catalog here. I'm doing that through a dynamic import with React Lazy. And there's some extra logic which detects whether my app is running standalone or as part of the, of the entire app. And it does something else based on that. So that's, that's really it. I, I'm just importing a regular React component. That is all I'm doing. It just isn't present in the, in the repository or in the build, but it will be at runtime. And you can see I can just use it as any regular React component. I can pass props to it. It's all possible. Okay, that's for the integration. Now, how do these apps communicate? Um, basically, the communication has to be kept to minimal, and there are multiple ways to do that. You can either use custom events, uh, or you can use React like Dataflow, which is like passing the props that I've shown before, or you can communicate using the address bar. Uh, for example, one component navigates to a route that has some sort of ID in a uh, query string, and another component parses that query string and fetches the detail of a component. That's a sort of a way to communicate between the apps. Uh, last but not least, cross-cutting concerns. Uh, if you have never heard of the term, it means uh, things that are used throughout your apps. So things like routing, authentication, uh, internationalization, nice. Uh, and also logging and other, other things like that. So again, multiple options of how to handle this one. Uh, the shell alone can do that, like the, the one microphone then that handles the others. Or you can pass config or instance objects to the individual microphone ends. Or you can use shared storage, but that's like shared state, which is kind of an anti-pattern for the microphone ends. And I'm going to show you how routing is handled in this app. So in my home app, I've got the hero section, which has one button. And this button uses the navigate hook. That's my own custom hook. If I go to it, uh, it emits a custom event, uh, my specific custom event. And this custom event gets handled by the, I believe it's called layout. Uh, da -da -da -da. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, it's handled by the layout component in the shell, which uh, listens for it. And when it actually gets the event, it navigates to the path using uh, React Router. So it's kind of a convoluted way, 
but that's one of the drawbacks of micro frontends. Some things like that are going to be inherently more complex. Okay, speaking of drawbacks, uh, here there are, because it's, it's not perfect, it sounds really good on paper, but when you are actually working with micro frontends, you will find that your infrastructure is much more complex. You can see I have four different apps in my repository. I have to handle all of them. I have to set up CI CD for them. I have to deploy them independently. It, it's just extra overhead in this way. Uh, Cross-cutting concepts can be tricky. I've just shown you that. Uh, they require effective cross-team communication, especially when you have like autonomous teams which each work on each app. They have to kind of communicate with each other and, uh, for example, agree on which things should be shared, which logic, which styling, uh, which tools should be used even, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, this, this is a huge one, actually. If you try to implement a micro front-end app that's like slightly more complex or niche than your usual Hello World app, you will find that there's uh, only a few resources on this topic, like in general. Like, uh, yeah, I, I'll get to that later. Uh, also, one of the major drawbacks is that you can't really officially use micro frontends with some of the popular frameworks and starters. So if you are using Next.js, I'm sorry, it, there is no easy and simple way to use micro frontends. Uh, there's an asterisk there because, oh, I'm not gonna get into it right now, but I, I'm not gonna get into it. it. It's just not possible, let's, let's stick with that. Uh, if you are using Create React app, you can make it work, but you have to like hack around it because Create React app is quite opinionated, so you have to like use Rewired or Crackle or whatever it is you use nowadays to kind of add to the module federation. And oh, and if you have multiple apps, they might have to, they might duplicate some dependencies. There is a mechanism to prevent that in the module federation, but it's not 100% great, and some dependencies will be duplicated. So. It's just something to keep in mind. Uh, finally, there are some uh, developer experience issues. So if I were to make updates to any of my micro frontend apps in isolation, it would like update automatically as you are, uh, uh, as you expect. But if I update uh, an app and then I look at my whole app, it does not update automatically. So it's kind of, that's not great. Not great, it could be and should be better. Okay, so we know what micro frontends are, how they work. Now, where would you use them? So, first of all, uh, a common disclaimer, micro frontends are not a silver bullet. And, oops, sorry. And you should only consider them if you are working on an application and you find yourself hitting these uh, pain points that I have mentioned er earlier. That is coupling, complexity, scalability, team organization. In any other case, I would not suggest using micro frontends because there's just uh, quite a lot of additional overhead and uh, yeah, it's just, it might be extra work for nothing. Another use case is migrating legacy projects. Uh, so the idea is that you have a huge project, a huge app that you want to migrate one feature or one page at a time and not like uh, all of it at once. And in that case, you can isolate the feature or isolate the page write it in your new technology, and then you can inject it into the host app. Uh, and an example of doing that is actually adding React to a PHP model view controller app. It's something we are doing on one of the projects. And the idea is that we created a React app that replaces a feature or a page. We bundle it, we just like uh, put it through Veed or Webpack, and then we integrate it in our host, which means we just link the, the final bundle, and it mounts the React components, and it just kind of works pretty well. And uh, in this way, you can uh, actually migrate all of your app uh, incrementally. Okay, finally, I would like to conclude this talk by uh, mentioning our experience with micro frontends. So, once we had a project with very specific requirements, uh, it had an enormous app store, like hundreds or of man days of work. It was really complex. Uh, the requirement was that it, uh, that it should be hosted on-premise, so we could not use Netlify, we could not use Heroku or Vercel, and it should be worked on by many developers, like tens, let's say. 
So yeah, that sounds like pretty good. Like even if we are building a new app, it hits uh, almost all of our uh, or, or all of our pain points. So we we decided, yeah, let's let's try microfrontend. And initially, we had like four to five uh, frontend developers at start, and we split the app into this was like a proof of concept phase. So we split the app into four microfrontends, a shell plus three apps. We had one uh, to two people working on an app. And we had some issues with the cross-cutting concerns. Like we didn't know how to do routing because React Router 6 just came out and it like completely overhauled how it works. So there were no articles, but we kind of managed to figure it out uh, by some trial and error. And we managed to actually get each app dockerized and deployed to Kubernetes. So we had that phase where we could scale each app uh, depending on the need. So yeah, and even when deployed, the apps connected well together and it just seemed to work. So yeah, so far so good, right? Well, uh, there were some issues with the project. Uh, it never expanded due to uh, complicated, uh, let's say political or budgetary issues. And ultimately it was put on hold indefinitely. So we had no chance to like continue working on the app and expand it and see how micro frontends really hold in the real world with like thousands of users, which is a bit of a shame, but uh, even that experience taught us that this might be an option uh, for specific projects. So what's our current stance, our current verdict? Uh, micro frontends can work very well for specific business cases, but do expect some issues. And if you are not uh, having those specific business cases, maybe consider trying something else and don't, don't get swayed by the hype. Yeah, and that's all from me. If you are interested in learning more, I do recommend the Martin Fowler uh, article on microfrontends, which is kind of like the most official thing you can find. And there's also a very interesting uh, article on Medium about problems with microfrontends from a company that has actually tried them for like six months and uh, yeah, they had some interesting discoveries. Okay, so again, that's it for me. And now if you have any questions, uh, feel free to go. Thank you, Lukash. We actually have a couple of questions on Slido, but before we take those, if there is anyone in the, in the room who has a question, okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned on the project that you have about four uh, micro frontends, if I remember correctly. Uh, can you expand on what was the communication with the backend? Would you have some kind of backend for frontend logic, or if you had a single monolithic backend, or how was it, and what was your experience with it? Uh, that one particular project was specific because we were dealing with healthcare data, so it was in this like specific uh, standardized uh, file format. If you've heard of it. And we eventually arrived at a solution where we were using backends for frontends. So each frontend ha had its own specific backend. And it was simply due to the fact that each frontend required so much backend work to like pull data, uh, pull data from different sources together and kind of uh, process them in a way that would be uh, readily available to the frontend. So yeah, backend for frontend. Okay, do we have someone else in the room with a question? Okay, let's take some from Slido, and maybe if we can uh, have the QR code here as well, if uh, so that people can, if there is someone who is shy, you can always scan it and ask indirectly. So the first one, how do testing and deployment processes differ when you use micro frontends? Uh, for the individual apps, the process is mostly the same, but if you want to test, for example, some sort of user workflows that runs through the apps, um, good luck. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's much more complex, it's, uh, and it's one of the uh, complexities of micro frontends, but it can be done, uh, it's just a little bit more complex. You, you kind of have to load all of your apps that you need in your environment to make it resemble the real thing. And the deployment is, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple, it's just deployed independently. You just need to wire them together, like the apps need to discover each other in some way. Okay, uh, next question is, is there an option to make remotes dynamic, i.e. different URL for different environments? Um, I think we had that exact problem, 
And we found out that in the config, like in the Vite config, you can't really easily do that. But we've solved that by having the address, uh, I think the address was directed at some sort of uh, load balance or discovery service. So it was like static address, but that address would always resolve uh, or be redirected to a, an, uh, a, a different app, like a different instance. So it kind of did uh, discovery and load balancing for us. So static address, but uh, we could scale the uh, individual apps uh, as, as we wanted, and it would always resolve to whatever app we needed. Okay, next up we have, would you say micro frontends are, quote, production ready? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm qualified to make that judgment. Uh, Martin Fowler thinks so. They rate them as uh, like, uh, I don't know what their rating system is. The, the last bit, like, yeah, I think they consider it production ready. I think micro frontends are being used pretty heavily by the big players, but the issue is that they are, they are not really willing to share their know-how, to share their knowledge. So there's just quite uh, a little of it on the market. Like, yeah, you can find 100 medium articles about how to make a Hell World micro frontend app, but that's about where it ends. Okay, and we have the last question, if someone else doesn't uh, ask one more. And that's, what about animations or other interactions between micro frontends? Um, let me think. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the asker means exactly, but when you think about it, when you actually inject the apps into your shell, for example, the result is the same DOM that you would get if you had the component or the uh, micro frontend in, in, in your shell. Like, the resulting DOM should be the same, so it should not affect animations, unless, of course, you are doing some sort of animations before the, the app is loaded. I, I hope that answers the question. I don't know, maybe if the person is here, they can, uh, they can tell us, or no, okay. And one more popped up, and it says, how do you deal with a state of a micro frontend that should be shared with other micro frontends? For example, user profile data. Uh, that's a good one, and it might be more of an architectural style question, because one way I can think of uh, solving that would be not passing user profile around, like directly, like all of the data, but maybe just a user profile ID. Uh, but yeah, that, that might not be optimal in some cases. So you can communicate using the, the custom events, or you can use some sort of shared storage, but really the, the less coupling you do, the better. And maybe you could split your, uh, your initial app uh, in such way that the user data would stay in one uh, micro front end so it doesn't have to be passed to the others. That's, I, I think that, that would be my answer. Okay, so it seems that's all for the questions. One last chance for anyone in the room. Okay, we have another, perfect. Uh, thank you. Uh, I know that uh, the team size was only one of the factors, but can you imagine uh, if you are working alone on the project or in two people, that other reasons for going with micro frontends would be as heavy that you would go through all the hassle and trouble and do micro frontends, for example, that you need the scalability and you would go through all these configuration issues and troubles and the development experience tr issues that you have, that you would go through it with even a small team of one or two people. Yeah, I, I think you can do that. I don't think you necessarily need to hit all of the, p all of the pain points I've presented, but if you have most of them, it's probably worth it, uh, especially for the scalability. If there's like a team of one or two developers that inherit a massive legacy project, yeah, they, they might want to migrate that to micro frontends, even though it will take some time and some effort. Okay, thank you, Lukashi. Let's give Lukashi one more round of applause. And now let's take a short five minute break so that you can stretch your legs and uh, rest before the next talk by Jakub Havelka.
to know each other and eat all the food. We will not bring it away, it will stay here for you. <laughs> okay, I think we can start. Yeah, so if I uh, wanted to be very brave, uh, I could jokingly say that the next speaker is a traitor. And that's because his favorite animal is an anteater and a raccoon even though he works at a company called Iguana. I think that's, that's a big problem, but it won't be a problem for his next talk. Please welcome Jakub from Iguana and his talk about Next.js 13. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? Perfect, okay, all good. If you need to bring my volume up, please let me know and I will try to bring my microphone closer to my mouth. So, today I'll be talking about Next.js 13 and especially about the app directory and what's changing with it. So, that's it. The first slide is, however, about me. So, uh, my name is Jakub Havelka. This is my email, so if you need anything, just ping me. I work at Iguana, like you just mentioned, this is my sweatshirt, Iguana, but previously our company was called Prague Labs, so maybe some of you might know Prague Labs. So a little bit of history for me and why I'm here, I started programming in like seventh grade on elementary, I was writing Java plugins for Minecraft, a weird start, I guess. Then I got my first job in PHP, as literally anyone here in Czech Republic, probably. Uh, then I found Vue.js on high school, and fell in love with it, but then I got a job offer in React and I just had to accept it, and now I fell in love with Next.js. And currently, as I work in Iguana, we have a new project called JaxWebs, and we use Next.js a lot, and Next.js 13 and the app directory was something uh, really interesting for us, so I took, <laughs> I took the blame eventually if something goes wrong and advocated for using the app directory, and so far, it's going pretty well, except few things. I'll be covering them. So, uh, before I was creating this talk, we were at Next.js 13.2. Now we're at Next.js 13.3.1. Uh, so, and a lot of things changed in this minor version. So, I had to reflect on that. So, in this presentation, we'll be covering the Next.js. There's a lot of things to cover. It will be maybe a bit plenty, but don't worry. We can, you can just come to me later and just ask anything. I'll try to explain all the details you need. So, uh, first of all, I think it's good to cover how do you even migrate to app directory because that's the first step that you will do if you wanna use this. So, uh, and first of all, let me say this, it is a beta feature, yeah. It is a beta feature. It will be stable in next minor version. I'll touch on that later, but it's still a beta and stuff will break. However, if you never worked with Next.js, it's really easy. Just use the Next.js 13, install the latest, and you should be fine. If you use something like Next.js 12, 11, 9, uh, your upgrade path might, uh, might differ a little bit. Uh, because, first of all, if you're updating from 9 to 10, 11, they offer code modes, which you can use to just easily update. I haven't used them, so kind of expect weird results, I guess. Hopefully, it will work. And uh, the biggest change, I guess, which, which, which came with uh, Next.js 13 was React 18 update. Just to note, React 18 really didn't change from 17 that much. It's, it should be just an internal change. However, some lips you will find just doesn't work with React 18, so you'll also have to update them to support React 18. And some of these apps just have a completely new API, and you won't be able to easily just migrate and switch to versions. But if you have React 18, Next.js 13, you're good to go with App Directory. One thing you have to do is to enable experimental flag App Directory to true in your Next.js config. That's it. Also, good thing to know, the new App Directory can be used with your current pages directory, so you can continuously kind of migrate, and we'll touch on that a bit later. And also, this is just a presentation. I'll be covering the basics. There's a lot of conditions, ifs, exceptions, I really recommend you reading through the beta Next.js docs. Uh, 
they're great. There's few things missing still, but I recommend you after this presentation, if you think this is interesting, take a look at that. That might help you. So uh, this is the code, how you enable the up there. It's, it's pretty much, it's pretty simple. Just enable the up there here in experimental. And compatibility and stability. So I will touch on this briefly. It's all beta, like I said. It should be stable in version 13.4. However, like I mentioned, we are using it on a production-ready project in a way, and it's kind of stable. You will find things missing. Sometimes when you're updating, things will break, but guys at Birdsell are really fast with fixing the stuff, and they're pushing kind of releases basically every day, sometimes two times a day. You can expect missing feature that's now being kind of obsolete with Next.js 13.3, which added four or four pages and stuff like that. Expect sometimes misleading documentation. Yes, that can happen. Expect random edge cases. If you're combining all these new features together, not all of them might work fine. And when you're raising an issue, if something is wrong and you think it's Next.js, well, please always provide a full min reproducible uh, repo. So first of all, there'll be a lot of explaining before we actually get to some kind of coding or showing some code. So Next.js 13 comes with this new concept, which is in React 18, and it's server and client components. So server component is a pure JSX, like it's a pure React component that has no state. So basically server component would be something where you have no use state, no use effect, no click handlers. It's just React HTML, JSX, and maybe some you know function call or something like that. There you can use uh, leverage the server components. If you don't want to use server components, you have to annotate them with this uh, use client notation at the top of your file. Uh, if you try to use uh, any client function like use state, use effect in your server components, it will crash and it will tell you that this should be a client component and you should add annotation. And by the way, everything in the app directory is by default a server side uh, server component. So keep that in mind. So if you, if you leverage some client stuff, you will have to mark everything with use client. Good thing to know, and a lot of people are confused with this, which I get, Client components are still rendered on the server. So basically, what you've been using until now in Next.js, that's basically client components. They're still rendered on the server, but they have this client functionality where you hydrate the JavaScript. So you send the payload, your HTML, and then you also send the JavaScript to hydrate your client. With server components, that's not happening because you're just shipping the HTML. They're basically stateless because you can pre-render them during uh, build time because they're stateless. Uh, server components can be nested with client components, so you can have your client's component within a server component, but you can't have a client component within a server, comp oh, sorry, you can't have a server component and client component. You technically can, there's some, you know, ifs, so read the documentation, it's covered there. Uh, depending on your usage, maybe, for example, for us, 80, to 90% of our website is still client components. You may be asked why, and that's the second part. If you're using styled components, emotion, or any CSS in JS solutions, well, you well, you know, it's it's bad. You can't use it. So basically every page will be a client component, but you can still leverage the server components and have them at, at like a leave at the starting point to fetch your data on the server, and then you can have your CSS in JS as a client components. As I mentioned, they're still the same speed like before, so you're not losing anything, still rendered on the server, so you should be fine. Also, this is something the Next.js and React team is working on, so eventually we will have support for CSS and JS and server components, but we're not there yet. Uh, this is a simple overview, I'll keep it here for like uh, 30 seconds, what you can do and what you can't do in server components. Uh, I think one maybe weird thing is the uh, warning symbol in fetch, fetching data on client's components. You can still do that. They're talking about uh, React 18 features and mutations and stuff like that. I won't be covering that here, but you can still call your fetch, use query, uh, whatever you want in client components. So if you wanna work with state or even handlers, you will have to force yourself to client components. If you're doing anything else, you can use server components and have your pages smaller, basically. So now let's get uh, to the app directory, which I'm talking here for like five minutes already. So it's 
pretty much still the same. They still use file system routing in a way, but they move from file-based routing to directory-based routing. And I'll explain that on the next screen. Uh, before in XJS, if you wanted to define a new route, you could define it by a file name. So it would have like a shop page, and then in that you would have index TSX file, and then maybe category TSX file. With this, you call all your pages page TS, and the actual path in the URL is defined by the directory structure. So there's the change. It can be, as I mentioned, used with uh, pages directory. So you can, if you just update now to XJS 13, your pages directory will still probably work, there are some changes, but it should work out of the box. And if you wanna just migrate like one or two page, you can freely do that. You can just have a different URL for that page and you can just use pages and up at the same time. It also brings a lot of new features. I won't be covering them here. So we have parallel routes, intercepting routes, a better error handling, we'll be covering that, better API support, layout system and root grouping and bunch more. And also the app directory will allow you to collocate the components closer to the page because now what's in the app directory and it's not called page or layout, it's just ignored by Next.js. So you can put your uh, FAQ component in the app directory and just mark it as a client because everything there is a server component. But now we don't need the source directory. Sometimes you might want it, but if you have some components specific to one page, you can nest them to the same directory and it should work all fine. One thing to note, if you name your directory with underscore, everything in that will be ignored. Just keep that in mind because it, it, it messed with me for a while. So this is basically a comparison uh, between the old pages and the up pages. This won't work because uh, we, are, uh, we have matching routes basically. But you can see here in pages, we have the API folder and then we have hello. Then we have shop. ID, index, information, and here uh, it's pretty much the same, but we now call our uh, pages page and the root is defined by the folders. One thing to note here, as I mentioned, they also improved the API capabilities. So now you can also, because before if you wanted to do API outside the API director, you would have to use rewrites or something like that. Now you can put it anywhere and just call it root JS, and that means it's an API root and we will be touching on those. So now let's get to the pages. So you define page by creating page.tsx file, ideally, please use TypeScript. Uh, <laughs> handles rendering of the specific URL, so it's basically just renders the contents what it gets. It can be either a client or a server component. By default, it's a server component. It accepts params and search params props. So that's your search params, query parameters, and params are those dynamic fields that you get from the brackets ID stuff. And new thing coming here is layout, which might be helpful for you. So I can imagine, you know, in your app, you, you have your header, your footer, and what basically changes on every page is probably just the content. And now you would have to put that layout to underscore app. That's, that's fine, but then maybe one page will have a different layout. So now you have to add conditions there, or maybe add the layout to every page or create the utility around the layouts, weird. Now you just create a layout TSX file and you get the layouts automatically. It accepts a children prop, which basically represents the page that will be rendered on the URL and you can wrap that children prop with your header and footer and it will work fine. It also works with nesting, so you can have as many layouts as you want. So as you go down the path, creating in directories, they will just nest into each other. I will show that on another screen. And again, it can be either a client or a server component, except a root layout, which is basically something that Next internally uses. That has to be a server component, but nothing blocks you just making that kind of dummy. And if you need client components, like your out management, you can put that to a client layout eventually. So uh, this is the example of layouts. Here you can see how we can nest them. So we have one root layout, this is this one, I think this believes here. Then we have the layout one in eShop, so sorry, this should be here. The app should be this one, this should be probably here off screen. Then we have layout two, this will be the internal shop, so it will be this one. So that's how you nest them, that's how we nest the layouts. This is how we write them, so you can see it's a page, uh, sorry, layout TSX file, which exports a function, which is a component that accepts the children, and this is your layout to internal a shop. So that's there. 
hopefully that makes sense. Another topic that we have to <laughs> kind of explain here is static and dynamic rendering. So uh, this concept already kind of exists in XGS 12, but now you have more control over it in a way, I guess. So static rendering is default. That means uh, the components, the pages are rendered at build time. So no dynamic both pages. It's all pre-rendered. Dynamic rendering means whenever you get to the page, it will render on demand. So that's basically what gets the side props is before. So again, as I mentioned, uh, all pages are by default statically rendered. You can opt into a dynamic rendering. It can also kind of guess it by itself. If there's like a fetch, it kind of guesses that this will be probably a dynamic rendering. And it can be also configured in the segment options on every page or layout. Uh, another new thing or new thing, a replacement for the APIs like I mentioned. So before that, if you wanted to do a new API, you would have to like make a folder API and then the file that would export one function. If you wanted to handle get post request, you would have to add conditions to that one function. With Next.js 13, you can put there literally anywhere. It's just called root.ts file. So if you want to do a root, don't call it a page, call it root.ts file and you have an API. And from that file, you export one, two, three, four, five, six functions, and each function represents basically one HTTP uh, option. So it's it's more easier, I guess. This is how, for example, a root works. So this is a simple health check. Uh, it's a get endpoint. It returns status. That's a JSON status, OK. And the status is 200. Errors and not found. So now you can kind of put four fours page level. So before you had this like 404 page that you could call in a way, but it all was all dynamic. But now in all of these directories, you can specify an error page just for that path. That's that's fine. Sorry, sorry. Error is for uh, error boundaries. So if you are using error boundaries and you want to have client sites error catching, you can use that. And not found is used for handling 404s. You can either invoke that in server components with function not found, or if you want to have a generic 404, if the page was missing, it's something that's not typed, you can just have a global 404 in your root, and all the paths that are not defined will fall there. However, I tried this, and it doesn't work in the correct next version, so <laughs> yeah, fun. Uh, loading, I won't be covering this, but again, if you're using uh, the React 18 features like mutating and stuff like that, Loading is for instant loading states, but I haven't played with this, so you have to look at the docs, how that works. Same thing, dynamic segments, those are the things called in brackets, uh, behaves just like dynamic routes, still allows you to do catch-alls, optional catch-all, and stuff like that. And again, if you're using dynamic segments, and I, as I said, everything is statically 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 rendered, you would have to provide generate static params in your page file, which allows you to generate those pages ahead of time. If you want to have this dynamic, you would have to opt that route into a dynamic rendering and add some support how you fetch the params and stuff like that. Root groups, this is one thing that comes in handy with layout. So imagine you, you have your app and you have two layouts, uh, but you want to share like a layout here, but then you have maybe your back office app here and your shop here. And you wanna you wanna still keep this layout, but you wanna modify it for, for this route, but you wanna keep the URL same. So these root groups and these like round brackets allow you to make these invisible walls which you can use to kind of split your app and le leverage the layout features. So uh, new thing that also changes is uh, navigation. So first thing to kind of uh, explain here, use router, if you're imp importing use router, there's a new import. The old one still works, but it's just for pages directory, so be aware of that. So if you want to use use router, use next navigation. It can do push, replace, and refresh. However, uh, there's it's missing completely the query parameters, because if you're doing static rendering by default, the query parameters are not known during build time. So it comes to a hassle. So if you want to use uh, search params, you have a hook just for that. And if you want to push new query parameters, you can do that natively so far. It's, it's weird. You have to build the URL with query parameters and push. Then we have use params. This basically returns all the dynamic params that are in the path. 
Then we have use path name. Again, this was before returned by use router. Now they have a specific ho hook for that. And also, these can be only used in client components. So you can't really tell on which page you are in server components. So it's, it's a bit difficult. Uh, use selected layouts. Uh, this returns the closest root segment. We have use search params, as I mentioned. This returns the query parameters, but you can't modify them. You can just get them, process them, and then you have to pass them to push in a formatted way. But they return it as URL search params, which is like the standard in, uh, in browsers. So I think there's even a function to just turn it into a string. Server components functions. So there are functions that you can use in your server components. Again, they will depend if you're using static, static, and dynamic rendering, because in static, you can't really look at the cookies ahead of time. So most of the functions just work in uh, dynamic rendering. So with cookies, you can access the cookie, but you can't write to it, weird. Headers, again, you can access headers, but you can't write to it. They, as I'm like on the blog, it's mentioned that eventually this will be coming, but so far you can just read them as far as I know. Not found, that's a function that you can call to just render that four or four page that you have in your directory. So you don't have to like have a condition, you know, if I return four or four, return this four or four component, now you can just call a function, it's, it's kind of smooth. And then you have redirect if you want to redirect to a different URL. Very straightforward. New thing that's changing is also data fetching. So they kinda extended the fetch API. So uh, now you have no get server side props, get static props, nothing like this exists. So if you wanna fetch data, you just call fetch. And if you're not using fetch and using, for example, Axios, editing those se settings might be a bit more complicated. I haven't found a way yet. You can still set up all these caching behaviors in the root segments, but I don't know if you can do like Axios pair call caching. I haven't found that yet. Uh, so, and it's great that they added this because it's more, more simple now because you just use fetch. It's, it's native. You don't have to learn what's get server side props, got what's get static props, and how it works. So, they just use fetch. It handles the duplication. So, if you have 10 server components, all of them calling the same endpoint, there'll be just one request happening. They won't be calling 10 times. 10 times. Uh, it, it allows you for a caching behavior, we'll touch on that, and revalidation, you, so you can still do your ESR. It also supports streaming and suspense, uh, works for an API call and server component, pages, layout routes, so now you can catch your, if you have like API route that communicates with your API, you can cache that result in that API route in a way, so you can cache on multiple levels now in Next.js 13. And now here's some settings, so if you just fetch, it will be force cache. That means it will be uh, fetched at build time and used. If you use revalidate, and this means seconds, so every 10 seconds this will be called and refreshed. And if you use no star, that basically means every time there's someone requesting this URL, fetch the data all the time. So basically get server side props with no caching. Again, good thing to cover here is SEO. Uh, so this kind of again changed, so it's now config and filed based, uh, and it's specified in the layout or a page file. So no more head component. Now they basically export, in each page or layout, you export a metadata function or uh, generate metadata, depending if you want to have dynamic uh, SEO tags or not. And by that, you basically define what will be returned in the head. Uh, and file-based metadata is basically if you, for example, have sitemap.xml and you want to do that dynamically, now you can call your sitemap sitemap.ts and have your logic there and it will build the HTML and they have all TypeScript support, so everything is kind of type safe. I'll show that. It, it's really cool. And again, if you have an API call that's being called in the sitemap, you can cache that on maybe revalidate it every 10 seconds, whatever. You, you can still use the fetch and leverage all these features. They work in all server components and functions. So this is the example of uh, metadata. So if you have a static page, you can use this. So you set up a title, descriptions, they support OG tags, preloads, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure what happens if you have a specific usage for thing that haven't, they haven't typed. I, I haven't gotten into that. So I guess they just create a list of few meta tags that you can use. And if you have, for example, a shop page where you have multiple products, you can use this generate metadata function 
which can accept the params and query parameters and return the meta asynchronously. And again, they will be kind of nested, so if you make a title here, it will just go down the path, so it works like had before. And if you overwrite the next level, it will be overridden. Makes sense. And this is the sitemap, so basically you will just create a sitemap file in your root app directory, and you, as you can see, they even have a typings for that, so you just make it the typeable and just return this, and you have a sitemap. You don't have to generate it anywhere. It just, it just works. I think it's, it's great. Another thing, sorry, this one. Uh, so static export. Uh, so next export is now removed. If you want to do static export, you have to specify output export in a Next.js config and then just run next build. Easy. And now they even support next image component, which wasn't supported previously, and I think that's also great. Uh, and the cool thing is, I, I guess, the, their TypeScript uh, plugin, I guess. Uh, which is used for validating those Next.js stuff. So, as I mentioned, there are some root conf like config per root where you can put specific, you know, you can just put dynamic there, maybe you can put error there, and there would be no validation. So they have a TypeScript plugin that can check if you're put what you're putting, those parameters, is, is fine. Uh, and it can also check the validity of server versus client components. And they also have this really cool feature, which is, again, experimental. I haven't used it, really. Uh, but it allows you f to enable type roots, and that will basically generate uh, a type pings for your router. So no longer you have to kind of guess what's the URL. It will support, so you, you will create your link or your router push, and it will start hinting you the next URL you can put in. And if you put a wrong URL, it will tell you. It works with dynamic segments. It should work with everything. Uh, some things to the end. Uh, so Next.js 14 has a work in HTTP streaming. Uh, streaming. I, I haven't worked with that. It's now supported on Vercel. If you want to stream your HTML, you can, you can do that. Uh, E18 is now not supported. Uh, however, they kind of, when I asked uh, Vercel Dev why they killed E18N, they said that there's a lot of people that are, you know, want to use it, but they have a specific usage, and they then tell Vercel, hey, we need this and everyone then kind of bends the idea, and it's not really like flexible. So they basically remove the E18N, but basically with the layouts and the app directory, you're able to create your E18 implementation with uh, however you want. So next, also next image is less JavaScript heavy. I think that maybe was introduced a bit before this, and there is a lot of more changes, a lot of exception like I mentioned, and so please read the documentation. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kubo. And now is the time for your questions. We don't have any in the Slido, so let's give space for you here in the room. And if you have a question, just raise a hand. And maybe, Tamashi, if I can ask you to put the QR code here again for the shy people. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so is there a question from someone? Well, if there is not, like, the only thing I can ask about are the animals. So, okay, thank you, Lukashi. Uh, are you using uh, the app directory and the next 13 new things uh, in a production app somewhere, or is it just something you're playing around with? Yeah, it's currently, it's not... Is it live? Okay, hold, okay, you can hear me. Uh, yes, it's not currently in like production, production, but it's already deployed on staging. So we're just event waiting like the switch, but it's a production app that should go out like hopefully soon. Okay, cool. I'm asking because I, I keep like observing this evolution, but I al always feel like, yeah, it's in beta, but let's not use it in a, in a real project yet. Yes, uh, as, as I mentioned, like I, I just updated from 13.2 to 13.3, no changes at all, and it just stopped working at all. Like it's it's weird, and in like five days it was fixed, but then broke a different thing, and then, yeah, it's it's in beta, but hopefully soon it will be stable. But I haven't used the intercepting route or the parallel routes, but from things I've used so far, everything kind of works perfectly, except the updating from time to time. Okay, I, I think I might have to wait a bit, but thank you. 
Okay, in the meantime, we have a question on Slido. And the question asks, is there a way to set a custom headers from page DSX for a specific route in new next? We used to do it and get server side props via set header. Yes, so if you're a page is a server component and it should be, you can just put it as a client component below that. Uh, as far as I know, the headers function just allows reading, but they have a note there that eventually you'll be able to write to it, but so far it's, it's not possible, I think, unfortunately. Okay, and one last call for the room. Is there any other question? It seems you are like a perfect speaker. You made everything totally clear and no one wonders about anything. Congratulations, okay? So give one more round of applause for Kaba. <laughs> Thank you so much. And before the last and uh, final talk, let's take a short break again. Uh, let's make it 10 minutes because I know the five uh, minutes was a bit tight last time.
Perfect. Oh, that was fast. I like that. I think if we did it for like 10 times today, the 10th time it would be just like 100% amazing. So, as I see that everyone is already settled mostly, I think uh, we can move on to the final presentation of today. The name of the last talk is uh, very dramatic. It's called Clash of the Titans, Gatsby versus Next. And the dramatic name is not a coincidence. It's because the speaker is a huge Mortal Kombat fan who loves drama. And that's Wojta Eschner from Digi2. Hey guys, can you hear me well? All good? In the back? Up, 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 up. All good? Better? Up a little bit more. So far, so good. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So, Alt F4. Awesome. So, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to present a uh, very nice topic. And it's, uh, as mentioned, very dramatic. It's uh, Clash of the Titans, Gatsby versus Next. What to choose? When? Why? How? Let's try to take a look at these two frameworks and how they cope with each other, what is better for which, and ultimately, who is going to take the glory? Who is going to be the champion of React frameworks? Let's see. But uh, first, a little bit about uh, myself. My name is Vojta Eschner. I'm currently working as a tech lead at uh, Digi2. Uh, I started as a PHP programmer. That's like <laughs> That's uh, almost everyone, yeah. Uh, but then uh, managed to go through quite a couple of languages. Uh, and uh, anyone who asked me, I'm just a nerd who loves IT. I play video games and I love Lego. So that's uh, about me and let's, let's get to it. So today we're going to cover these topics. So we're going to take a look at Gatsby and Next. How, how do I, uh, well, what's like the basics of, uh, of these two frameworks. We'll take a look and then uh, see the differences between the data handling. So how do you fetch data with the frameworks? What are the differences between those two? Uh, we are going to take a look at the routing system and how do they differ? And of course, if you're new to both React or only, or not React, you're all skilled React developers, but if you're new to Gatsby or Next, we'll try to take a look at the learning curve. So uh, if you want to start, is it easy? Is it not easy? Let's see. And of course, as mentioned, we're going to try to see who's the winner and uh, who will be best. So first, we've got some decisions to make. Uh, if you come to a new project, what do you choose? Uh, will you choose Gatsby? Will you choose Next? Will you choose anything else? Like, uh, what, are the, what are the pinpoints of, uh, of making these decisions? Usually, you just uh, task with a project uh, from a product owner, and he says, hey, we got a new project. And you ask, OK, but uh, what, what should I choose? I don't know. Do you need server-side rendering? And the product owner says, I don't know. Choose one. Yeah, and you just like stuck in a, in a place, and you don't know what to do. So just a, uh, a, couple, of, a couple of hints of uh, how uh, Gatsby and Next uh, come to some several topics. Like, let's say we've got, uh, we've got TypeScript support. Awesome. In both, of course, you uh, can use JavaScript in Gatsby, but please don't. Uh, everything is type, and it's super, super easy. So TypeScript, both. Perfect. We got it. Then, next box, we've got server-side rendering and static generation. Again, checkbox is in both of them. We've got them uh, also in Gatsby and also in Next. Then, you're a fan of GraphQL, APIs, whatever. Sure. Gatsby can do this for you, as can do next. Of course, someone will ask about where do we host it? Do we host it on our, our uh, on-premise cloud, in our basement, or any other cloud provi provider? Sure, why not? You can do self-hosting anywhere you want. And of course, you've got the possibility to use uh, Gatsby Cloud, that's for Gatsby, or Verso for next. So, so far, so good. We've got boxes and each of, uh, each of the columns. So, so far, they seem that uh, they are pretty much the same. Uh, now, this is like more, uh, let's say, uh, statistics. So please don't make your decision just based on the stars on GitHub or how many issues are there. Uh, because uh, as you can see, uh, the stars are pretty much 50% uh, like lower for Gatsby and then for Next. Uh, but um, 
this is uh, this is just to uh, to see to see that uh, next is like yeah it's uh, right now it's uh, it's uh, more much more downloaded than uh, than Gatsby and much more popular than Gatsby. Uh, this is really interesting. Uh, this is the number of downloads of Gatsby versus Next in the last year. Uh, Gatsby is the blue one and the orange one is Next. This one is pretty cool. This, uh, this little spike, this is when version Gatsby 5 was released, uh, which uh, introduced for the first time server-side rendering. So er everyone was really keen on uh, trying that and see uh, how it behaves. In, compar in comparison with Next, so you can see everybody was writing Medium and Dev2 uh, uh, articles about how these two differ. And then, yeah, I don't know, for some reason, Next users have Christmas and Gatsby users don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. So th that was just some statistic uh, for, uh, for starters. So now let's take a look on how they both handle the data. Uh, so first we've got Gatsby, and uh, there are pretty much three ways to uh, do some uh, some data handling, so how to get get the data. What is Gatsby most known for and is most used for is static site generation. So that's pretty much um, you you get uh, everything was uh, is done via uh, on during ah, sorry, everything is done during build time. So uh, each page you have defined within your routing, and we'll cover that in just in a bit, uh, will be created as a static. HTML, CSS, JS file, and that's it. You can host it anywhere you want uh, on your FTP. Please don't uh, S3, S3 uh, bucket anywhere. Firebase, your choice. That's that's fine. Uh, then they've got something new that's called a deferred static generation, and that's uh, used for pages where you can really nice establish a base of what is the critical and non-critical path for your site. So, for example, if you have a site where there are hundreds of pages, you don't want to build them each of those every time you build a project. It will take a long time. You don't want to do that. So, with this different static generation, you are able to define which pages are the most critical for you, and you want to do the uh, static site generation, and which don't. Uh, for those that don't go through the different static gen generation, they will just uh, be uh, be handled during the uh, request time, so it's still it's gonna use the server side rendering, and the first guy landing on that page will be very sad because it will take some time to render. But the next guy who lands on that page will hit the already static generation generated site. So all good for the second guy, not for the first one. And last but not least, as I mentioned, Gatsby version five introduced server side rendering. Uh, Server-side rendering, um, well, it's it's still the basics compared to Next, uh, but we've got a really nice function, get server data, which uh, is really, really, really similar to what uh, you might know from Next uh, version 12, the get server-side props. It's just a fetch uh, of, of data from anywhere you want. You get the props and you just pass it to any of your component, and that's it. That's There's nothing else to it. For next, uh, we've got on the first page, uh, or so for the first um, first part, is the server-side rendering, which is the next most known for. Uh, you've got your dynamic uh, dynamic pages. Uh, each each page can be um, uh, built or like generated on uh, on runtime uh, with uh, dynamic params, and uh, yeah, that's the example from next uh, JS12 with the get server-side props. We now know that in uh, next uh, 13, it's a little bit different. Thanks to Jakub. Um, static generation is also a thing. Uh, it uh, not sure in which version it was introduced for, uh, but uh, in next 12 you've got the next export uh, command. In next 13 this is now gone, and you have to use the output for to be the export. But uh, it's the same uh, if you compare this static generation to the Gatsby one. You get the static HTML, static CSS, static JS, and that's it. Again, you can host it anywhere you want. And which uh, with, with this one, the incremental static generation, this is a little bit different. You've got the, um, the possibility to um, create pages, but uh, you also have the possibility to cache them and invalidate the cache when you need. So uh, pretty much uh, this um, discovers an anything uh, from using um, uh, a static HTML site, and you, you just, um, well, 
you just define an API which uh, uh, which, which is uh, somehow secured with an API token which is only known to you and you can invalidate these pages on during runtime. So next time uh, a user hits this page that was invalidated, it gets refetched and a uh, user sees new content. So again, if you compare, you, you've seen Gatsby, we've got the static uh, site generation, we've got the server side uh, generation and the same we've got with Next done a little bit differently, but still pretty much the same. Okay, next to the routing. How, how does Gatsby handles the routing? We've got, again, three possibilities, and they uh, you, you don't have to stick only with one. You can combine those. So uh, if you decide that you want to use, uh, for example, the first one, the create page function, which is a specialty of, uh, of Gatsby. Uh, here is an example. So we've got the create page, which uh, is run during build time, and uh, you just uh, put uh, the path that you want to be generated. Uh, the component is like the standard React TSX component. And again, you put the path in there and uh, you can put uh, within the context, you put the data, any data you want. And this data can come from, again, anywhere. It can be GraphQL, API. It can be also um, uh, files with, uh, that are within uh, the, the Gatsby, Gatsby folders, uh, which uh, I'm skipping is the number three. But uh, that's the first one. You get the API uh, data from anywhere during the build, and er, voila, uh, it just works. Second uh, thing you can do is the pages directory, which is similar to Next. So whatever is defined within the pages directories will be rendered during uh, build time. It also uh, handles the dynamic, um, well, dynamic uh, parentheses, so you can have some sort of uh, dynamic capability there, but be careful whatever, if you're not using server-side rendering, so gets before and lower, whatever does not exist uh, within that uh, built folder will get you a 404 on hard refresh. So that's, uh, that's uh, one thing to um, take into consideration. Uh, I've already started to cover the file route system which um, is really cool and uh, doesn't, does not, uh, is not covered yet natively in the next at least Last week it wasn't. It happens. Uh, it's, it changes so fast that some of these uh, become obsolete really fast. Uh, this information, but uh, file system is really cool uh, in a way that you can define uh, markdown files or YAML files on, or any other uh, supported format, and uh, Gatsby can use these to generate the pages. And it also um, under ho the hood uses GraphQL support, which you can uh, use to uh, filter or find specific markdown files. So if you want to have a static site, for example, blog or anything else, which doesn't get changed a lot, which is gets be ideal for, because it's just static content, you can use markdown files or any kind of static files. It's really cool. Uh, as for next 12 uh, and the routing, uh, again, pages directory, and now we're gonna have everything in app directories and everything is gonna be named page TS and it's gonna be really pain to find something in there, but hopefully uh, that, that, well, it will not probably change anytime soon, but let's see and hope it's gonna work out. Uh, so that's one of the ways. Of course, uh, you can also in, in Next12, you can uh, build uh, and get static content. As I mentioned, we are the export uh, and the static props, anytime you want, that's fine. In next uh, 13, Jakub uh, talked about it, so I'm gonna go, not gonna go into the detail about that. But I looked through uh, what else can be used for uh, pages generation, and I also find that there are some plugins for uh, file system APIs uh, for Next. So uh, if you're interested in that and want to have a Next uh, React site and want to use the uh, file system API, you can do that via a plugin. So it, again, it, uh, it handles uh, definitely Markdown, YAML, I guess XML is also a way to do that, uh, and it, it is uh, supported as well. So again, comparing some differences, but it reaches the same goal. Uh, the, the routing, uh, it works both uh, well in, in both of the cases. I started to, work, uh, to talk about plugins, and plugins is uh, a little bit of a special word uh, when it comes to Gatsby, because in Gatsby, we've got thousands of plugins. And that's, uh, that's because uh, we have, uh, anyone can write 
Yeah. Anyone can write any plugin they want, and it can be uh, accessed uh, via uh, standard NPM as an NP NPM package. And there is a Gatsby config JS file where you get uh, all of the all of the uh, plugins uh, configured and, and change that. Uh, the vari variety of the plugins differ. You, you get everything from CMS integrations, which is really cool because you've got a plugin for, sorry, WordPress. Uh, we, we've got uh, plugins for Strapi. We've got plugins for uh, Shopify. Anything you want, there's probably a plugin for that. So it's really easy to make, um, l let's say, a, a standalone app, which is just uh, fetching data from some other third-party system and showing them in a really nice, smooth React way. Um, if you wonder, uh, wonder what plugins are there, uh, there's a link uh, for uh, uh, Gatsby.js. And uh, if you would, would uh, like to start with Gatsby, you haven't done it before, and you want some bootstrap or just uh, put it on your way, uh, th they got a lot of themes prepared. I found one which uh, looked really cool. Uh, it was Gatsby, which was uh, already pre-installed with Material UI. So if you're into that, uh, that's a way to go. Of course, uh, there are tons more with Tailwind. Without Tailwind, anything you want, it's probably there, or you can write it your own. Uh, when it comes to Next.js, there is not, uh, let's say, uh, a plugin way uh, of, of doing things uh, because uh, Next is much more of a standard React app just with just some more cool stuff. So uh, you can pretty much use any NPM package you want in, in there, and if it works, uh, then okay, perfect, it works. You don't have to touch it. Uh, I found a really nice GitHub which uh, has a uh, uh, really nice set of uh, articles uh, which are up to date, hopefully. So uh, there are articles, videos, tutorials, and also a list of, uh, they call it plugins, but they are pretty much only NPM packages uh, which, are, uh, which are done um, for, for React. So uh, you all know the INTN for uh, translations, but there are some custom hooks which go through authentication, session management, uh, or or any, uh, any other. One thing I wanted to cover in a little bit more detail uh, is image optimization, because uh, it's uh, usually um, a pain to have uh, all of these uh, optimized on a production side, uh, because normally product designer uses Figma, and in Figma you've got 11 megabytes of, uh, of, um, of images, and they upload it, uh, and expect that it will render in 0 0.0001 second. Uh, that's not the case usually if you are not running it on a NASA computer. So uh, image optimization can be done in several ways. Uh, again, some comparison. We've got the, uh, some special components. Uh, we've got one for next. We've got the image component for next. And uh, with Gatsby, we've got two. We've got static image and Gatsby image. The static image is uh, for content which pretty much never changes. So it's the logo, it's the footer image. And that's it. And Gatsby image uh, is used for uh, is used for dynamic content. So, for example, headers, uh, product images, whatever comes from the data somewhere else. Um, I've searched for again plugins uh, as uh, as uh, as to call them. So, for um, for Gatsby, we've got a lot of Sharp based plugins. There are billion of them, literally. Uh, if you if you put Sharp in the in the search, you've got like bazillion results, and each one does pretty much the same. Uh, it optimizes images, some in a different way, some in a, another way, but still optimizes images. For Next, I found that there is a plugin called Next Image, uh, which uh, adds all support for WebP format and some more optimization uh, on the way. Uh, so this is something that uh, we at Digital are currently taking a look at, because it's really cool to see uh, how this will behave. But one personal tip, and that's just my personal opinion, if you control the source, do the image optimization on the, on the back end, if you can. Learning curve. So if, you're if you want to start with Gatsby or Next, uh, it's uh, not 
easy on one of those. It's a little bit, uh, if you're familiar with React, you will have no problem with Next. Uh, of course, there are some specialties uh, for the rendering and where to put what and how to name it, of course, but that's gonna be the same in, in Gatsby. But for Gatsby, uh, the configuration can be a little bit more tricky but because there are like f four or five files, uh, each doing something differently. Uh, we've got the Gatsby node, Gatsby SSR, Gatsby config, Gatsby plugins, Gatsby something else, the JS, and everything that doing something else. So it can be a little bit more tricky for newcomers to see what is where and what is doing what and why is it doing that even. Um, but uh, again, um, try both of those. It's, it's really fun to see and compare uh, what, uh, which one is better. Okay, and so which one is better after the comparison? Any guesses? No? Next, 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 next. Next JS, of course. <laughs> Next JS. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm choosing the diplomatic answer here uh, because it really depends on the needs of the project. If you want to use uh, static site generation for a site that either never changes or for some reason do you, the customer doesn't want it to have server side render, use Gatsby uh, because for now it's still a little bit better than Next, but if you want server-side rendering, go for Next. My personal uh, opinion. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Well, I think you made at least one person very, very sad because the first comment in the Slido is, I hope the result won't be a tie or a it depends. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys, I don't know who wrote it, but uh, I hope you're not gonna cry today. Well, uh, are there any actual questions uh, in the room? We have one more here in Slido prepared. But first, let's see if there is anyone in here. Okay. Uh, because we have people on the stream, so if you can take the mic. Hi, uh, I just wanna ask, uh, Maybe you already said, but what's the better option for the junior developer? Junior developer. Uh, does the junior developer know React? Or, uh, not yet, but it's in the yet. plan. Okay. Hmm. Everybody has some, you know, uh, bigger yeah. picture. Uh, again, sorry, it depends. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, well. If, if it is just a, um, let's say, a project where this uh, junior developer should learn uh, the ropes and the stuff, I would go for Next because it's more React in a way. Uh, there is not that many specialties except everything else in the app folder. But uh, Gatsby is more special uh, when it comes to newcomers. So in this case, I would choose Next. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Is there anyone else here who would like to ask something? Okay, so I'm gonna do the question from Slido. Uh, it says, are there any contenders other than Gatsby or Next? Yes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Well, maybe if you could elaborate a bit more on that. Uh, yeah, sure, well, hmm. What else is there? Well, Gatsby and um, and uh, Next are one of one of the most uh, used nowadays. Let's see. Well, you you can also also go with the standard Create React app, I guess. But that's kind of it. I can't find. Uh, I I can think of any more. Do you know any more? Remix, Astro, sure. That's it? Uh, and next only, yeah, I know. Okay. I have a icebreaker question. I also love Lego, and you mentioned that. So which is your favorite Lego set? My favorite Lego set? Well, um, my favorite Lego set is the, um, how do you call it in English? <laughs> Medieval blacksmith. Oh, yeah, that's, that's. <laughs> this was my favorite question so far, I loved it. Easier to answer. Yeah. So is there anything else? I mean, technical or, um, I don't know, about Voita's hobbies? Le Lego-specific questions? Yeah, we can do Lego-specific questions. 
later, later on. Okay, so it seems we are done here. Let's give one last round of applause for Wojta. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you so much everyone. This was the last talk of the evening. Now is the time when you can go finally network, eat the rest of the food if there is something. And this time I won't tell you to come back and I won't bother you. So thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed uh, everything and now enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>